Sometimes when you talk with people, they'll say, I have good news and bad news. So which do you want, the good news or the bad news? It was just uh, brought to my attention. You saw Dick Ruff come down the aisle. Uh, Bob Crownover went to be with the Lord. That's good news. That is good news. That's not bad news. It's bad to us. We're left behind. That's good news. Right after I became your pastor about seven years ago, I was involved. I'd never met his wife, but I was involved in her funeral. And I watched Bob. I walked with Bob. I went out to lunch a lot with Bob. I went to his home. And oh, my soul, he loved the Lord and he loved Dortha. But that's good news. But let's pray for the family right now. His sons have not necessarily walked in the way of their father. And I don't say that with a judgmental spirit. I say that with Bob's own blessing that he was concerned about the walk of his children, as we all should be. Let us pray. Father, we pray the divine hand of comfort on the crown over family. Thank you, Lord, that uh, you gloriously saved he and his wife, even through the ministry of this church. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, Bob would have told you that uh, I don't remember the pastor's name. It doesn't really matter, but uh, Bob and Dorothy were not people that knew the Lord, even though Bob had uh, come from Oklahoma, where sometimes people think everybody knows the Lord because there are a lot of churches there, but Bob said that the pastor of this church came to his home one evening and shared Christ with him and led him from death into life, from death into everlasting life. And I'm so thankful for that ministry of that pastor. I want to call your attention to Jude's text, verses 14 through 16. Uh, We're right right in the middle, and it's a rather unusual passage. I want to show you some things out of the book of Jude. And... uh, See in the few minutes that we have together what God has to say to us. I want to read those verses together with you. I'll read them aloud and you follow along. Jude is found in the New Testament just in front of the book of Revelation. And uh, I'm not going to take time to read the whole text. And to our guests, what I have made as a practice is to try and deal with what those verses are saying. And so Jude 14 through 16 are our special focus today. And I read from God's Word and it says, Enoch... In the seventh generation from Adam prophesied about them, Look, the Lord comes with thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict them of their ungodly deeds. And they have done in an ungodly way and of all the harsh things ungodly sinners have said against him. These people are disgruntled grumblers walking according to their desires. Their mouths are utter, their mouths utter arrogant words. They are flattering of people for their own advantage. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, sort this out for us, Lord. Show us how all the way back to the person of Enoch, to this present day, how true, how living, how powerful your word is. And your word is truth, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. A little while ago, one of the dear ladies of this church took a moment to ask me a question. And she said, what, what does the word apostasy mean? Apostasy, A-P-O-S-T-A-S-Y. Well, a number of definitions. One is to desert, to desert, not desert like sweet cookies that we're going to cook for the policeman, but to abandon one station or position. Uh, So it's desertion. It is also could be defined as denial to say that's not true. That's not right of the truth. It is also dilution. It is to take the truth and say, well, you know, the Bible is true, but what we want to do is, is pour something into it to dilute the truth. And you can find the word diluted in churches today where people say, well, that's what the Bible says, but that's not what the Bible means. And so I want you to understand that I affirm the Bible. Uh, Yes, there's much about it that I don't understand. Yes, there's parts of it that God has not opened to me and given me the illumination to say, I understand it. And you might say, well, that's rather naive or foolish of you. Well, call me foolish, call me reckless, but I believe that Christ died on the cross for my sin. And as a result, my sin is forgiven. My record is expunged. I am a new creature in Christ Jesus. And when I go the direction of Bob Crownover, I will lay down this mortal 
fleshly tabernacle and I will take upon myself in that moment the identity that Christ died for me to experience and I will become the person that God created me to be. Call me a a, a naive person. The Greek word for apostasy means to stand away. And we in the church like to talk about fellowship. But what an apostate does is separates themselves from the orthodox teaching of Scripture and says, come, come follow me, come a little closer. Stand away from those other kind of people. One other commentator said about apostasy, it is falling away from the truth to move in a direction and a distance to separate you from the truth. I want you to understand that Jesus affirmed the Old Testament. Jesus, well, there, there are scriptures that say that, that Jesus was teaching, and on one occasion he, he said something about that, uh, that the judgment on a contemporary audience that he was speaking to will be more or greater than that of the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. That's what Jesus had to say. So sometimes when Jesus was preaching and teaching, he would use the Old Testament to explain who he was and what God was doing. Not only that, uh, he used the story of Jonah or the person of Jonah, and he said to that contemporary audience that the judgment of Jonah is is coming. And how, how did God judge the world in the time of Jonah with the great flood? How many people survived? Only seven and I do believe that. I want to tell you I affirm that. Are there facts that I perhaps would be curious to know? Absolutely. How how did God flood the world? Why did God flood the world? And the answer is found in our biblical text because God judges sin. There is a penalty. There is a judgment. There is an authority greater than yourself. God judges people for sin. So, Rather than worry about you apostatizing, I want to make sure that what you affirm, and that word means to what are you willing to uh, testify. You come back tonight and you'll hear some people of your church family give a testimony about what God showed them or what they experienced or what God did through them in vacation Bible school. To affirm means to identify or devote oneself to. I, I want you to follow me following Christ. The Apostle Paul says something like that. The Apostle Paul and Tim Clark say, I dedicate myself to the truth of Scripture, and I want you to uh, be able to say I am dedicated to Scripture. The other would be to declare positively, I am absolutely, without a doubt, believe that God is the author of His Word, that the Old Testament and the New Testament are complete. In fact, it says at the end of the book of Revelation that we, there is an admonition, a warning not to add to or take away from Scripture. But what about these people that Jude identifies? Well, there's two groups. Not that Enoch is a group, but I want to call him a group. He is a member of a lineage of people that... Well, let's just turn to Genesis, the book of Genesis. You need to see this for yourself. And, uh, I mean, it, I, I, I can say without a doubt, it's almost unbelievable. I mean, when you stop and think about what we're about to look at, Genesis 5 and 18. 5 and 18. Genesis all the way back. I love the sound of those pages being turned. It suggests to me that you're doing one of two things. Either you're listening and learning, or you're listening to try and catch me at something that I shouldn't have said or I misspoke. Either way, uh, it makes me know, never mind, you will, uh, you will stand the judgment, as I will, for what I say. You will stand the judgment for what you say that you believe. In verse 18, it says, Jared was 162 years old when he fathered Enoch, my soul. One of the men at Bible school this week is a 52-year-old first-time father. I can't imagine. I can't imagine having those responsibilities at age 52. I, I, w- I first became a grandfather when I was 52. I was not ready to change diapers then or now. I was not ready to get up in the middle of the night to meet the absolute total needs of that little person that depended on me. I'll slow down, Irene. <laughs> I'm sorry. But I'm just going to jump square with both feet and say, I believe that Jared was 162 years old when he fathered Enoch. 
162. Uh, Uncle Lou, raise your hand back there. He's 102. Can you imagine? 102. 102. I can't imagine that. Helen Wiley, bless her heart, turned 98 yesterday. And Jared lived 800 years after the birth of Enoch, and he fathered his sons and daughters. So he was 162 when Enoch was born, and he continued to have vitality of life. He was virile, if you would, not only in the body, but in the faith. I'll show you why I think that. But even he continued to father children, but he was 162 when Enoch was born. And so Jared's life lasted 962 years, and then he died. And I've got to tell you, I believe that. I really do. I think days were days in that day. I think years were years. And I think he lived to be 962. That is a long life. But then it says in verse 21, Enoch was 65 years old when he fathered Methuselah. And I can just hear Jared saying, you know what, son? I'm kind of embarrassed. I was 162, and here you are just a teenager at 65, out there having children already. You should have waited until you were a man. (laughs) Life belongs to God. God gave Enoch Methuselah. And after the birth of Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years, and he fathered more sons, and he fathered more daughters. So Enoch's life lasted 365 years. And here is the most profound thing. It's not the length of their days. It is everyone else in Enoch's family had died. They had experienced physical death. Even with what would seem like the unlimitless amount of time, there was a finality to their lives except for Enoch. And the Bible says this about Enoch. It says he walked with God and he was not there because God took him. Now, if I were a reporter for CNN, MSNBC, ABC, NBC, Fox, or any of them, I would be rather cynical and I'd say, no, probably what happened to Enoch was he got to be senile and they lost him. They just lost him. I mean, how, how could you not lose somebody that was 365 years old? Who's looking after him? Who? I mean, when you get to that point, who needs you? You don't need somebody. And that's the, the, the autonomy of spirit and soul that it, it, it is in our independence. But I've got to tell you, I don't believe what the news media would say. I believe that Enoch was there and then he wasn't there. Because the Bible says God took him. Now, I want to show you something as long as we're in the book of Genesis. And I'm not going to get to tell you everything that I want to tell you. But I want you to look at Genesis chapter 4 with me as long as we're there. Genesis 4 and 17. And it's just right across the page. And so, for just a second, while you're looking for that, the Bible says that Cain killed Abel. And then the Bible says that... Adam and Eve had another child by the name of Seth. Okay, so that's one family group. And then we move over to the, the son who was the murderer. His name was Cain. And it says in verse 17, Cain knew his wife intimately and she conceived and gave birth to Enoch. Isn't that interesting? So under the descendants of Adam and Eve, over here, if you would, on this side, on the right... You have Enoch, who is a, 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 a direct descendant of Adam by Seth. And over here, you have the line of Cain. My question to you is, of which Enoch do you descend? Of which Enoch would you identify with? You see, there is the, the, the lineage of Cain, the murderers, the liars, the deceivers, the unbelievers. Or are you a, a descendant of the line of of Seth to Enoch. In fact, if you were to look in the New Testament in Luke's gospel, it's either chapter 3 or 4 where they begin, the Dr. Luke begins to write out the genealogy of Jesus. And when you get, he does it in reverse order. He starts out with Jesus to Joseph. So he goes back in time. And he winds up with Adam And right there in the ancestry of Jesus is Enoch. Which Enoch? The Bible will tell you. Do you believe that? I do. I want you to know I affirm that. 
Do I understand how God could keep all of that together and keep it straight? Not even so. There's times I can't find my shoes. How could God do that? God is beyond me. His ways and His thoughts are beyond the human understanding. And so sometimes what we have to do when we arrive at that point of saying, I don't understand, we need to be careful and not say, I don't believe. Simply be honest and say there are some questions to which answers have not yet been given. Some questions, the answers have been given, but the answers are hard, and they don't come with explanation. One of the most profound words that all of you taught your children, I'm sure, was the three-letter word, why. It seems innate, born into children, one of the first words they learn to say, daddy first, always, because of who father is. No, they usually say mama, mother, or some derivation of that. But it's not long, once they begin to have the construct of thoughts, pretty soon they arrive at the position of saying why, which means they don't believe, they don't understand, they like the attention that you give them, and I want you to hear this. God, your heavenly Father, is not opposed to you asking him why, but you have to be willing and agreeable to say, God, you answered that question, but I don't understand the question. It might be because you have refused to move in a position of affirming and saying, I believe that I'm going to take God as his word, an attitude of faith, and I affirm, I affirm, I believe, I take a stand. We're fast approaching that celebration of our great nation, and it says something in the uh, uh, Declaration of Independence that we hold these truths to be self-evident. One of those is that all men are created equal, and there are certain rights endowed by the Creator. And so our contemporary class of politicians think that rights come from government and that the government can make us give things to other people because I'm going to sound political, but I'm simply suggesting that when a president and the Congress tells us that health care is a right, there are those that would carry that to a further extreme and say, well, if you're going to provide me with health care, then you need to provide me with a level of income. And if you're going to provide me with a level of income, you need to provide me with shoes and socks and underwear and pants and shirt. And that is not the purpose of our government. The Bible says all good things come from God, not men. We hold these truths to be self-evident. Among them are life, liberty, and then the pursuit of happiness. Now, we move back over to what the Bible has to say. And Enoch, in the seventh generation, declared that God's judgment, God's judgment is coming. God's judgment is coming. And I don't know about you, it seems like since I've been in this world, just my study of history, my examination of human behavior, it seems to me like the world is perfecting sin, getting darker and meaner by the day. Now, I wasn't alive during the time of Joseph Stalin, and he allegedly did away with about 20, not thousand, 20 million people. I wasn't alive during the time of Adolf Hitler, and by number, he is said to have killed six or seven million people, that's pretty bad, and those are former days. So I would suggest to you that then was bad, and today is bad, and the reason it might seem like today is worse than back then is because you are experiencing it, and the Bible says, let not your heart be troubled. Let not your heart be troubled. What are we going to do Let's focus then. There's two groups that I want to speak to ever so quickly. And I just want to tell you, you've known some people. You've seen some people. They've even been in the church. And verse 16 describes them as discontented grumblers. Do you know what a discontented grumbler is? It's like a baby. It's like a baby. And you have changed their diaper more than once. You have burped them. I don't know how you burp, but I'd throw a child up against my shoulder and I'd beat on them a while. You know, or I'd put them across my knees and I'd bounce them. And I would uh, ask my wife, to, are they hungry? Let's check their diaper again. And it, it seemed at times that that child would not be contented. They were just grumbling. 
God's word tells us there are going to be those kind of people in the kingdom. They are going to go to church with you. My concern is that you not be enticed to become like them. They are grumblers. And then it says they're walking to their own desires. The reason that they're in church is not for the salvation of souls. It's the service of self. They're there to get what they can. They might not be able to get on a committee elsewhere in the community, but they'll arrive on a committee and they'll feel so important about themselves. They are self-serving or self-feeding. And it goes on to say their mouths utter arrogant words flattering people for their own advantage. Years ago, a pastor told me, and he said, you need to be careful about what you believe that people say to you about you because the same person that builds you up can tear you down just as quickly. So I had to decide whose opinion mattered to me most in church. God's. God's. There will always be those people who will say nice thing to you, they'll pull you close, and then with words of flattery, they'll stick the knife in your back. I tell you true. But what are we supposed to do about them? Jesus used the the symbol of a farmer, and he sowed the seed, and his uh, hired help came back, and he said, Master, out in the wheat field there are tares, T-A-R-E-S. I always describe them as T-E-R-R-O-R-S, tares, in the harvest. Should we go out and pluck the tares out of the wheat? And Jesus, using that metaphor for farming and the church, he said, no, at the time of harvest, at the time of judgment, there will come a separation. The, the wheat will be harvested and saved, and the tares will be consumed and burned by the fire. There are six or seven things that I want to give you really quickly. I'm apologizing, Irene. The first is, I think what out of this text that I would take away, where can I apply this to my 21st century faith is, I want you to say, I affirm the Old Testament. I affirm the Old Testament. Jesus affirmed the Old Testament. The second thing is, I believe, I affirm the God of the Old Testament. The God of the Old Testament. Because you see, the the world is going to come at you. Even in the body life of a church, you will have people, their favorite I think it's a preposition, is the word B-U-T. Yes, but. Yes, but. I'll leave that alone. There's small children present. Affirm a belief in the God of the Old Testament. The third is, affirm the belief of the prophecy of the Old Testament. And all of these, all of these I could spend a series of sermons on, but affirm a belief in the prophecy of the Old Testament. Enoch prophesied that the judgment of God was going to come upon those kind of people. Has that judgment happened? The answer is no. But it is happening. It is happening. God is in the process of judging, but the consummation or the end of that is yet to come. Number five, affirm the presence of kingdom troublemakers. Just go ahead and acknowledge it. If if we're going to be a church... We're going to attract those kind of people. My admonition is don't become like that kind of person. Don't associate with that kind of person. Don't pay pay attention to what they have to say. Say that God has told us there would be troublemakers in the church. And the last one is affirm that God's going to deal with the troublemakers, the kingdom troublemakers. I like that one. I do. God's going to deal with them. Somewhere in the Bible it says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. And I might be able to get someone and do something to them. It might feel good to me for a moment. But I can tell you what, when God gets, as they say down south, a holt, A-H-O-L-T, a holt of someone, mm -mm -mm. it is everlastingly bad when the God who is creator judges a person for their troubling his church. So which Enoch do you identify with? The Enoch of Cain or the Enoch of God? A question that can only be answered by the individual. You might say, I don't understand the thing that you said today, Pastor. Why are you talking about this person who at 65 had a child? What does that have to do with me? You're not asking the right question. 
the right question is, who is Jesus? That's always the question, who is Jesus? The only way that you can understand who Enoch was is by the teaching of the Holy Spirit. And the only way that you can get the Holy Spirit is by acknowledging that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior and Him becoming your Lord and Savior. The answer is in Jesus. The teaching is in Jesus. The strength is in Jesus. The power is in Jesus. The truth is Jesus. And that's why Jude, Jesus' half-brother, was saying the God of the Old Testament is moving to a climactic time in the event of this world. The world will have never seen anything like it when the judgment of God comes down. But praise God, the Bible also says when the judgment comes, those in Christ will be caught up. They will be with him forever and ever. Amen? Let us be that person Believing what the Old Testament says, believing the prophecies of God, believing that God's judgment is coming on them. And sometimes I like to say, you just wait, you're going to get yours. That's the human side of me. The other part of me is to say, oh my, they need to know Jesus while it is yet day. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day in which we have acknowledged our earthly fathers, but greater so. We bow our knee lower our head and say thank you for choosing to be our Father, to be our Maker, our Creator, the Giver of life, but not just life physical, but everlasting life through the life and the death and the burial and the resurrection of your Son. We affirm these truths. Our prayer is that they would be self-evident through our lives, Lord, that we not just love you with our lips, but we love you with our life. We love you with our lifestyle because Jesus is our Lord. This we pray in Jesus' name. The confidence that I have when I preach is this, that the Holy Spirit's already been at work in your life. He's been talking to you during the week, suggesting things, prompting you, trying to redirect your life. And my job is through. I give the invitation and you respond to who Christ is and what he says about you and what he asks you to do. Stand together as we sing.